All right. Hello, hello, everybody. We're having a good new year. Today we are going to do a live reading of part two of the um, chapter in Energy and Orthodox Theology and Physics. We're looking at uh, the language of Orthodox Theology and Quantum Mechanics. Part one, we looked at um, we looked at the, uh, the the chapters about Saint Gregory Balamas and Niels Bohr uh, and putting in dialogue the language of Orthodox Theology and Quantum Mechanics. Uh, part one is. Um, one of the videos that I made, you can go ahead and check it out, where we looked at St. Gregory Palamas. We looked at the controversy between uh, Barlam and St. Gregory Palamas. We looked at the really kind of double clicked on the issues with language and the issues with um, kind of the cultural moment that we find ourselves in, in terms of my commentary and how a lot of this, this, um, this integration or a lot of this, this challenges with language uh, can be, uh, you know, uh, can, a, sh a light can be shined on it by looking at this connection between these sim sim uh, somewhat disparate uh, kind of uh, divisions of human thought uh, and theology. So we looked at St. Gregory Palamas. We looked at um, going beyond the words to the reality they represent. Again, the relationship between words and reality. Um, we looked at the modes of knowledge uh, and the role of the passions, which I found fascinating. Uh, we looked at the, the meaning of symbols in St. Gregory Palamas. Um, and we looked at the purification of the soul versus a focus on method. And then we ended with a, uh, an example from the homilies of St. Gregory Palamas. And um, we're going to be looking at Niels Bohr in this reading here. So if you guys can hear me, please let me know in the chat. We'll get started here in just a minute. Hope everybody's having a great 2023 so far. Uh, this gets a little dense, but I think it shows uh, the challenges that uh, Niels Bohr was having along with his compatriots with trying to form a language to understand and explicate the insights of the experiments that were being done in the realm of quantum mechanics. And the uh, aporia here is the uh, the challenge of putting a, a language is, is incorporating the limits of language within language itself when explaining and talking about something like quantum mechanics, as you could see, got very tricky. But I think this um, this kind of aporia here sheds light, sheds light on kind of our contemporary issue with a, we're, we're seeing the kind of mass manipulation of language um, in the popular culture, which has led to a lot of the disintegration of institutions and trust in media and in and institutions that, what, that were once held at least ostensibly as trustworthy. So we're going to get here into uh, Niels Bohr and, and the kind of self uh, challenges he was having in the conversations he was having as he was trying to describe the insights that he was gleaning from quantum mechanics and the, the difficulty of, of communicating these insights using Newtonian classical linguistic frameworks. Um, and we talked about the the challenge in the introduction earlier in the chapter. So please feel free to go check out the first reading uh, part one that I have again on my channel. So we'll get started here. Um, and please feel free to chime in in the chat. I'll be checking in from time to time, but I figured I would do a live reading here and see how much we can kind of get through. It's about 20 pages, but I'm just going to start uh, kind of reading right now. So let me know what you guys think. I hope again, everybody's having a wonderful 2023, I think it's going to be a very interesting and fascinating year. Um, I don't think it's going to be uh, anything but, and I think it's going to kind of increase in intensity. So looking forward to that somewhat. So um, let's get started here. So the title, or Niels Bohr, subtitle is Keeping the Words Without Keeping the Meaning of Words. The philosophical legacy of Niels Bohr has been received in controversial ways. Even his own followers shared a general feeling of uneasiness with respect to his use of words and why disagreements with respect to what he really meant to say. For example, Paul Erdenfest wrote to him in a letter from July 17th, 1921. So again, we're looking at early 20th century here. Quote, now, dear Bohr, every person I know wails only over the fact that you write your things so briefly and compactly that one always has the greatest trouble fetching all of the ideas out of the fruitcake. Close quote. The point here seems to be that Bohr appears to have struggled with language. 
He was missing words. One could, however, look at Bohr's struggle in another way. Heisenberg noted several times that Bohr did not have a problem with language, but was in the process of creating a new one. In this process, he, quote, tried to keep the words and the pictures without keeping the meanings of the words and of the pictures, having been from his youth interested in the limitation of our way of expression, the limitation of words, the problem of talking about things when one knows that the words do not really get a hold of the things, close quote. Bohr's quote-unquote obsession with questions of terminology and his struggle with language point to a problem of a much deeper character, and this is the use of ordinary language in scientific language. The motivation from the entire epistemological approach of Niels Bohr can be summarized in what he called the epistemological paradox of quantum theory. Quote, on the one hand, there's an apparent incompatibility between ordinary language and the requirements for an unambiguous description of the atomic processes. On the other hand, we need ordinary language to communicate. Specifically, we need classical concepts to, quote, relate the symbolism of the quantum theory to the data of experience. Close quote. Again, we are reading from uh, Energy and Orthodox uh, Theology and Physics from the chapter The Language of Orthodox Theology and Quantum Mechanics, and we're looking at the insights and the, the challenges posed by Niels Bohr with linguistic representations of the insights that gleamed from quantum mechanics. Back to the text here. The key question was how to use classical concepts in the description of quantum processes by taking into account one, the impossibility to have a visual image of quantum realities, two, the discontinuity introduced by the quantum of action, the fact that the energy for quantum objects can take only specific discrete values, three, the probabilistic nature of quantum laws, four, the principle of uncertainty, which does not allow for the simultaneous accurate measurement of some coupled physical quantities, such as the position and momentum of a particle, and five, all the resulting epistemological challenges. Bohr's answer was that one, the outcomes of measurements have to be described and communicated through the concepts of classical physics. And two, these classical concepts should no longer be interpreted as referring to quote, absolute attributes or intrinsic properties of quantum objects. In Bohr's work, these two points are always associated with the idea that the language of quantum mechanics is a symbolic scheme, which is in deep contrast to the intuitive description of physical quantities provided by classical concepts. Bohr wrote that the quantum mechanic formalism, quote, represents a purely symbolic scheme, permitting only predictions as to results obtainable under conditions specified by means of classical concepts and that it, quote, defies unambiguous expression in words suited to describe classical physical pictures. So we're seeing here this tension, this tension building up between classical linguistic representations, conceptual framings, and the experimental results of quantum mechanics and the, um, the challenges in making sense of them. I think this is important, um, again, we're seeing the consequences and the implications of this disconnect play out in real time. All right, we're going to look at the meaning of symbols in Niels Bohr. Again, hope everybody is well. Feel free to uh, pop in in the chat. I um, hope everybody can hear me here. And I'm going to hope everybody's having an excellent 2023. All right, so the meaning of symbols in Niels Bohr. Bohr used the word symbol in several contexts. One of his main points was that the discontinuity introduced in classical physics by the quantum of action cuts out the access to the possibility for a visual representation. And from this point of view, the link between the symbol and the, visu and the visualizable as a representative of the bridge between the everyday view of reality and the quantum view of reality is left to the symbolic realm alone. Bohr's more general concern was, quote, to emphasize the impossibility of the claim that words can represent reality precisely and completely. I think it's it's interesting just to step away here and what was happening in the similar time frame is we were seeing the, the semiotic revolution. We were looking, looking at linguistic revolution in philosophy where we were looking at semiotics, how we're playing with um, uh, signifiers and they're signified and there's really no connection between a symbol, a signifier and what it signifies, right? That they're just 
disconnected and self-referential. It's interesting that we're seeing from quantum theory, from quantum physics, and in linguistics, the same aporia being you know, kind of elucidated here. All right, so according to him, words only orient us, quote, orient us in reality by their immediate or derived reference to demonstrable circumstances, close quote. There are no quantum concepts, Bohr says, but only classical concepts and quantum symbols. All our ordinary verbal expressions are a reflection of our customary forms of perception from the point of view of which the existence of the quantum of action is completely irrational. Quote, in consequence of this state of affairs, even words like to be and to know lose their unambiguous meaning. And if nature thus escapes the grasp of words, how can we say anything at all except through the symbolic language of quantum theory? Close quote. Bohr often repeated that, quote unquote, reality is also a concept of meaning that when he, we discuss what is real in the quantum world, we are trying to learn how to use the concept reality correctly. The challenges associated with this learning process come from the fact that quantum objects are non-visualizable. Quantum objects are non-visualizable. The non-visualizable character of quantum objects justifies the need for the adoption of a symbolic representation of the quantum world. Quote, the world, the word representation indicates that there is something real, i.e. something mind independent is being presented. The word symbolic indicates that the representation does not look like the reality represented from the simple reason that nothing can look like non-visualizable entities, close quote. At the same time, when asked whether the language of quantum mechanics could be considered as somehow mirroring an underlying quantum world, Bohr, ans Bohr answers was that, quote, there is no quantum world. There's only an abstract quantum physical description. It is wrong to think that the task of physics is to find out what nature is. Physics concerns what we could say about nature, close quote. The last statement does not imply that there are no mind-independent quantum objects since ultimately there is a quantum reality, quote-unquote. That becomes the object of study in any quantum physics experiment. One might say the aim, quote, one might say the aim of experimentation is to put questions to nature. I love this quote here. One may say that the aim of experimentation, I'd like to know what you think, right, is to put questions to nature. And the answers to these questions will depend on the way the questions were asked. Hey, Pano, what's up, man? I see in the chat, Aristotle's idea of hylomorphism doesn't seem so stupid now, right? It's very interesting. All right, moving uh, complementarity here. So that was Niels Bohr on symbolism. In the description of quantum experiments, the classical concept of particle and wave remain indispensable. Again, just to reset here, we're looking at energy in orthodox theology and physics, and we're looking at the language of orthodox theology and quantum mechanics. We're looking at the work of Niels Bohr here, trying to make sense of it in light of the first part, which was a deep dive into St. Gregory Palamas. So in the description of quantum experiments, the classical concept of particle and wave remain indispensable. Quote, one of the two conceptual clusters can be adapted to any experimental situation. Neither fits every experimental situation. When this conflict is reduced to an explicit statement such as, quote, the electron is a wave and the electron is a particle, one, one seems to be countenancing explicit contradictions. Close quote. Bohr's answer to this emerging contradiction is the principle of complementarity. Complementarity was introduced as a way of using intuitive classical concepts within the context of the new quantum physics. It is an attempt to dissolve and not to promulgate contradictions. It makes it possible, quote, without leaving common language to create a framework sufficiently wide for an exhaustive description of new experience. Close quote. Complementarity is, def is definitely something that allows one to remain inside of the realm of classical concepts. However, by dealing with classical concepts, complementarity sets the stage for the overcoming of their natural limitations, as well as for the emergence of a new relationship between phenomena and objects. Quote, the language of classical physics is an extension of ordinary language that has incorporated new categorical and quantitative expressions and, 
by a painstaking historical process, fashion these concepts into coherent systems for representing physical reality. Here we bump our heads against the limits of language, yet we cannot simply abandon this language. It supplies an indispensable basis for reporting and communicating information concerning experimental results. So we can see the challenges and difficulties uh, being worked out here and Bohr's response, which I think is the kind of root of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is this complementarity of using classical uh, kind of Newtonian linguistic frameworks to describe the results from quantum mechanical experiments. Next section is a genuine quantum realism. Here we touch on two points that were considered as a basis for accusing Niels Bohr of anti-realism. First, this is the fact that by adopting the framework of complementarity, we are dealing with the limits of knowledge of quantum reality and that the limits of knowledge become part of knowledge itself. It should be pointed out, however, that Bohr never used such statements. Instead of speaking about the limits of knowledge, he was more inclined to simply say, that's all that is to be known. Second, this is to answer to the question of whether reality existed independently of the observer. In relation to the first point, one could highlight a statement by Heisenberg, who in conversation with Albert Einstein, after referring to what Bohr had taught him about our inability to describe processes in time and space with our traditional concepts, also added that, quote, with that, of course, we have said very little, no more, in fact, than that we do not know, close quote. In a similar manner, Charles P. Snow, a physicist and a novelist laureate of the scientific community, quote, diagnosed the same convic conviction as he let scientists speak of what had just been achieved by the discoveries of quantum mechanics. Quote, they have found the boundary of knowledge. Something would remain unknown forever, close quote. Quote, one of the results of this new representation of matter was to tell us what we could not know as well as what we could. We were in this, we were in sight of the end, close quote. Considering the limits of knowledge as part of knowledge itself necessarily affects the way of using concepts and words in quantum mechanics. Let's, let's read that again. So considering the limits of knowledge as part of knowledge itself necessarily affects the way of using concepts and words in quantum mechanics. Almost seems like a fractal. The fact that words and concepts do not exhaust the reality they represent cannot be easily accepted by scientists who keep looking at the wor world within a classics, classical physics attitude. Quote, in addition to his inconsistency in using the word nature unambiguously, Bohr also seemed to forget that since no expert in quantum mechanics could ever claim to have observed nature as such, let alone nature as a whole, it could not be part of any discourse on quantum mechanics as long as its Copenhagen interpretation was true. But there was a far greater problem, a sinister trap in Bohr's unfolding of the ultimate consequences of his interpretation of quantum mechanics. We here come, he declared, quote, upon a fundamental feature in the general problem of knowledge, and we must realize that by the very nature of the matter, we shall always have last recourse to a word picture. in which the words themselves are not further analyzed, close quote. As astonishingly, Bohr did not seem to suspect the self-defeating nature of his utterance. For if words were impervious to further rational probing, then the end of philosophy was not merely in sight, but on hand. Add to the chat here, Pano, Einstein, Heidegger, Heisenberg, etc. a bunch of the best minds mining the zeitgeist 100 years ago. Crazy time. Yeah, I agree. And I think the fruits of their mining are um, just starting to be realizable as we come up to the limits of our uh, our ability to make sense of the world socially and culturally, not just from a mathematical perspective. So we're seeing this, this indeterminacy and this uncertainty spill out into the cultural space, which is a uh, uh, crazy time is a great way, succinct way to put it. Back to the text here. Uh, one can see the unfortunate misunderstanding, misunderstanding of Father S. Jockey in interpreting Bohr's statement in terms of giving up scientific realism for some sort of agnostic subjectivism 
as well as interpreting Bohr's focus on the subtlety of the bridge between words and the reality they represent in terms of giving up philosophical reflection in general. In relation to the second point, one could also highlight a statement by Erwin Ir Schrodinger, quote, a widely accepted school of thought maintains that an objective picture of reality in any traditional meaning of that term cannot exist at all. Only the optimists among us, and I consider myself one of them, says Heisenberg, or says Schrodinger, look upon this view as a philosophical extravagance born of despair in face of a grave crisis. We hope that the fluctuations of concepts and opinions only indicate a violent process of transformation, which in the end will lead to something better than the mess of formulas that today surrounds our subject. According to Father Jockey, quote, the possibility for Bohr consisted in restricting discourse to aspects of reality while barring questions about reality itself, and especially about its objective existence. In Bohr's case, this was all the more laden with further problems because the aspects in question were more opposite, nay, mutually exclusive than merely distinct. He tried to hold them together by offering the idea of complementarity. These aspects could really complement one another only if they inhered in a deeper reality about which Bohr could only be agnostic. A harmony of relations or aspects complementing one another, such was Bohr's epistemological message, a message void of reference to the ontological reality of anything harmonious. About the entity which embodied the harmony of relations, he was not permitted by his own premise to make any claim, and he carefully avoided doing so. One can easily detect, again, Father Jockey's unwarranted mistrust of Bohr's epistemological message, including its relationship to the way words and concepts are used in relation to quantum realities. According to Jens Haybor, the main reason for the existence of similar judgments is the confusion of questions of realism with questions of ontology, or what he calls the ontology realism fallacy. Quote, classical concepts of realism, objectivity, completeness, etc., are only redefined within a highly integrated conceptual framework called classical ontology, close quote. It is exactly the presuppositions of classical ontology that is discarded in quantum mechanics, which means that, quote, the very concepts of realism, objectivity, completeness, etc., have to be redefined in the quantum context, close quote. All presumed problems in quantum mechanics, such as the one expressed by Stanley Jockey's statement about Bohr's overall epistemological attitude, are largely produced by the, by the illegitimate imposition of classical ontology onto the quantum domain. Without going into too much detail, one could just emphasize the questions about Bohr's genuine quantum realism, a term suggested by Jens Haybor, are the subject of an ongoing scholarly discussion, as well as a point, point out the position expressed in the insightful works of David Faverholt and Jens Harbour as the one that appears to be the most relevant within the context of the present discussion. One should note the comments of Father Jockey were made before some of the decisive experiments in quantum physics. These experiments demonstrated that his suspicion about Bohr's epistemological viewpoint were ungrounded. According to Richard Mueller, quote, most physicists today accept the Copenhagen interpretation. Einstein continued to dispute it until his death in 1955. Meetings are still held in which the few and the proud debate the reality of quantum physics with long mathematical and esoteric discussions of possible alternatives, but most physicists ignore these closed meetings. Quantum physics works. Quantum physics works. That's good enough for the silent majority of physicists. The latest developments in quantum physics suggest that, quote, we can no longer assume that the properties we measure necessarily reflect or represent the properties of the particles as they really are. As Heisenberg had earlier argued, quote, we have to remember that what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. Famous quote there. This does not mean that quantum particles are not real. What it does mean is that we can ascribe to them only an empirical reality. All right, now, so we're moving into a comparative analysis. In the comparative analysis, analyses of the linguistic aspects of the theology of St. Gregory Palamas and the philosophy of physics of Niels Bohr, one should clearly point out that this is not an attempt to examine the religious views of Niels Bohr, neither an attempt to compare two different religious worldviews. It is well known that Bohr, in his scarce references to God, was very careful in avoiding any traditional religious connotation. 
According to Dave, Dave, David Faverholt, quote, Planck was religious and had a firm belief in God. Bohr was not. According to Father Stanley Jacques, quote, Bohr never, symp never sympathetic to anything genuinely transcendental, let alone supernatural and Christian, was most careful not to give unwitting respectability to the idea of God who can choose with respect to nature. Much less would Bohr have tolerated the reintroduction of God into rational discourse through the mediation of quantum mechanics. The haste with which he tied to dispel the indirect appearance of God in the scene spoke for itself. Moreover, when it came to dispelling the remote flicker of God, Bohr was ready to forget that his own premises permitted him to perform only ambiguously a feat, which he meant to be an unambiguous philosophical exorcism. There was not even a trace of ambiguity in the manner in which Bohr now set up the idea of nature against the banqueting of the notion of God, close quote. At the same time, however, Bohr was very deeply in interested in the relation between language and the unambiguous description of the world by making the point that, quote, physics and linguistics are both part of man's age-old endeavors to clarify his position in that nature of which he is himself a part, close quote. The clarification about Bohr's religious attitude was needed in order to point out that the comparison between the linguistic aspects of the theology of St. Gregory Palamas and the philosophy of physics of Niels Bohr should focus on their epistemological insights by taking into account the difference in the nature of the realities they were discussing. So again, we're not looking to conflate these two uh, um, thinkers. It is important, therefore, to be fully aware of the challenges that could emerge during the application of comparative approaches in domains as different as orthodox theology and quantum mechanics. One of the ways to deal with these challenges is to adopt the principles of analogical isomorphism. Analogical isomorphism presupposes the existence of two sets of terms from two different conceptual systems and neither affirms nor denies similarity between them. What it does assert is that the network of relations in one set of terms is similar to the network of relations in the second one. The method concentrates on the structural similarity of the two sets of terms and not their specific meanings. It examines the ways the two sets of terms operate in their proper context. The analogy, therefore, is sought between the two ways of operation and between the two types of relationships. The advantage of such an approach can be found in the opportunity to use existing knowledge from two different domains, to develop insights of potential benefit from both domains. In our case, the expected outcome of such an approach is the articulation of new insights from the identification of specific common themes, issues, or patterns of use emerging from the examination of the relationship between words, concepts, language, and reality in orthodox theology and physics. That's a very succinct description of the nature of this dialogue here. So next we're looking at the uh, focus on experimental experimental epistemology. Again, we're looking at the language of orthodox theology and quantum mechanics through the uh, lens of St. Gregory Palamas and Niels Bohr. One of the obvious points of similarity between St. Gregory Palamas and Niels Bohr is the fact that they deal with the challenge of, of using words, concepts, and language within the context of an empirical epistemology. Although this is quite a general statement, it helps in opening up a number of emerging common thought patterns. One of these issues concerns nature of the unknown and the shift from known to unknown. St. Gregory, Gregory Palamas is concerned with the true knowledge of God and the challenge of using human words and thoughts in expressing the experience of acquiring such knowledge. The problem comes from the fact that the uncreated qualities of God cannot be expressed through human concepts. In this sense, every attribution of names of the words to God is, strictly speaking, inappropriate. There are no words that could adequately express God. In the experience of theosis, concepts about God have to be put aside since this experience discloses the fact that no created concept corresponds to the uncreated reality of God. Focusing on discursive knowledge about created beings is a way of progressing towards the knowledge of God is doomed to failure. Quote, the fathers stress that all the expressions and concepts that a person can have are products of human thought. Concepts and expressions do not come down from heaven, and God did not personally create concepts and expressions in the human mind. 
The fathers base this teaching on their experience of theosis, which leads them to stress that every human language is a human invention. Man is the creator of the language with which he communicates with his fellow man. There's no divine language. God does not have his own language that he gives to man, and he does not even communicate with man via some special language that he gives to those with whom he communicates. Language is the result of human needs. People formed it in order to help them communicate and interact. Close quote. And I think we've seen how that can go uh, very bad very quickly. Uh, we seem to be living within a, another Tower of Babel situation, Tower of Babel situation currently, kind of a fractal Tower of Babel, which is quite dizzying. All right, back to the text here. Uh, the biggest challenge then consists in defining the criterion for choosing words in referring to God. However, there is, quote, no way to discern which words are appropriate for theology and which are not. There is no unambiguous distinction between acceptable and unacceptable terminology, close quote. The only criterion that we can use for choosing a specific terminology when speaking about God is the criterion of reverence, which is based on experience. The experiential basis of this criterion for a proper relationship between specific human words and God is another point of similarity. There are words that are not good to be used in reference to God and other words that are respectful enough to be used in reference to God. Quote, in this context, the epistemologic, epistemology of the fathers, which is clearly empirical, is in its entirety quite useful, at least for Orthodox Christians, and perhaps for other Christians as well. You could even call it quite modern. Close quote. Niels Bohr deals with the knowledge of quantum objects and the challenge of using classical concepts to describe the quantum world. There are no other, there are no, there are no other than classical concepts and there is no quantum language. We need the concepts of classical physics, but these classical concepts could no longer be merely attributed to quantum objects. It becomes inappropriate to assign words and concepts to quantum objects outside of the context of our interaction with them. In addition, these words should be able to provide an unambiguous description of the experience in a way that we could communicate to each other. The language of quantum mechanics cannot be considered as somehow mirroring an underlying quantum world. It is in this sense that, according to Bohr, there is no quantum world. The task of physics is not to find out what nature is, but what one could say about nature. By keeping the words and the pictures from classical physics without keeping the meaning of the words and of the pictures. There's a fundamental limitation in our way of using words and our ways of expression since we are faced with the problem of talking about things knowing that the words do not really get a hold of things. This is the source of the epistemological paradox of quantum theory. There is no compatibility between ordinary language and the requirements for an unambiguous description of quantum processes. However, we need ordinary language and classical concepts to relate the symbolism of the quantum theory to the data of experience. And the only and ultimate criterion of doing this properly is the lack or the minimum level of ambiguity in the process of communicating our experiences. Uh, to the text here, Pano, a language is not monolithic. Adam named the animals on the basis of what they are. I agree. I deal with people all the time who obsess over performing the liturgies in Greek only for example, which I love to do, but it can lead to a deep stagnation in the mind and the heart. If you can't translate these deep notions out, you end up risking spiritual delusion and the inability to bring outsiders in. Yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's right. Um, and dialogos is key, quote, let us reason together, says God. Yeah, amen to that. All right, here, uh, I'll go for a little bit longer here. We're looking at going beyond classical logic using opposites versus complementary terms. St. Gregory Palamas points out that there are no concepts in the created world that could be attributed to God as a way of identifying him. Quote, so on the one hand, we do attribute a name to God, but only if, on the other hand, we take it away from him. For example, although we say that God is light, we negate this at the same time by saying that God is also darkness. We do not add this qualification because God is not light, but because God transcends light. But when the fathers speak about God and, uh, and attribute opposes opposites to him, they negate Aristotle's law of contradiction 
and in doing so overturn the entire edifice of Aristotelian philosophy. This means that the fathers do not follow the rules of logic when they deal with the theological matters or talk about God. Close quote. This is because the rules of logic are valid insofar that they are valid only for God's creation. According to Niels Bohr, all our ordinary verbal expressions are a reflection of our customary forms of perception from the point of view of which the existing of the quantum of action is completely irrational and illogical according to classical physics standards. The adoption of the principle of complementarity seems to be contributing to this, quote, quantum irrationality. However, by dealing with classical concepts, complementarity sets the stage for the overcoming of limitations of using classical words and concepts by allowing for limited, mutually incompatible extensions of the concepts of classical physics language. It's a mouthful here. Kind of getting hot. I don't need those. The type of extension depends on the question we put to nature and the experimental setups that embody these questions. One can use either the wave or the particle cluster to describe a particular experiment and interpret the results. One cannot use any fusion of these to describe reality as it exists objectively. The principle of complementarity, therefore, does not conform to classical logic, and Bohr was among the first to realize that a proper understanding of the relationship between the two complementarity aspects of a single reality requires the use of a new logical framework. Here it is important to clarify in what sense exactly the principle of complementarity does not conform to classical logic. It's getting a little dense here. I like it. The problem does not consist in the fact that two profoundly opposed models, wave versus particle, that preclude one another in a given situation are both necessary to achieve a complete understanding of a quantum object. The principle of complementarity ensures that we never apply both models to the same entity at the same time, i.e., to the same experimental configuration or measurement. It is only if we try to apply both models to the same entity at the same time that contradictions would arise. In order to clarify the emerging problems of complementarity in relation to classical logic, I will use, I will use a comment made by Bohr during the discussion period of a lecture delivered by him at a conference on new theories in physics in Warsaw, May 30, June, uh, June 3rd, 1938. One of the positions expressed by von Neumann after the lecture was that a complete derivation of quantum mechanics is only possible if the traditional calculation of logics is so extended as to include the so-called transitional pro probabilities, probabilities that account for the possibility of particles to switch from one complementarity state to another, not only for the probabilities of being in one or the other of two complementarity states. In other words, Van Neumann was arguing for the need of a quantum upgrade of classical logic. Here's the summary of Bohr's reply. Quote, uh, Professor Bohr expressed his admiration for the skill with which Professor Van Neumann has treated the fundamental problems of quantum theory from the mathematical and logical point of view. He pointed out that the same, at the same time how the very simple experimental cases which he alluded to in his paper showed in more elementary form the same essential points as those which appeared in the mathematical analysis. We must also notice that the question of the logical forms which are best adapted to quantum theory is in fact a practical problem concerned with the choice of the most convenient manner in which to express the new situation that arises in this domain. Personally, he compelled himself to keep the logical forms of daily life to which actual experiments were naturally confined. The aim of the idea of complementarity was to allow of keeping the usual logical forms while procuring the extension necessary for including the new situation relative to the problems of, ob of observation in atomic physics. Close quote. Quote. No, back to the text here, sorry. Yeah. In this statement, Niels Bohr clearly points out that by introducing the principle of complementarity, his main intention was to deal with the problems of logic and not to create them. Interestingly, he emphasizes the need for dealing with a new situation. What is that new situation? There was a reason to speak about a new situation since before the emergence of quantum physics, all physical objects were known to exist in one out of two forms, as a particle or as a wave. 
i.e. some of the physical objects existing in nature possess the properties of a particle and others possess the properties of a wave. They were either particles or waves, and there was no way for a particle to become a wave or vice versa. After the emergence of quantum physics, scientific experiments clearly showed that for one and the same physical object, it was possible to manifest the properties of either particles or waves. In other words, it became possible for physical objects to drastically alter their manifested properties depending on the, inter on the intention and the specific design of the experimental setup of the observer. In a way, one cannot speak anymore of some objectively existing properties of quantum objects independently of observers' experimental intervention. The properties of a quantum object emerge within the context of the experimental setup and observer's mind behind it. This contradicts classical logic, which assumes that physical entities have well-defined properties and all logical statements refer to those well-defined properties. The role of the principle of complementarity was to allow for such, for such a new transition. It is important to point out the difference between the concepts of complementarity in quantum mechanics and, quote, using of opposites in orthodox theology. The principle of complementarity helps, to rep helps in representing two profound oppositions that preclude one another in a specifically given situation. It is, however, impossible to talk about the coexistence of two different natures of one and the same quantum object, but only about its two complementarity natural manifestations. This is quite different from the situation in theology where, for example, one could call God both light and darkness at the same time without identifying him with either of them. In addition, we never stop worshiping Christ as a personal or hypostatic unity of a human and divine nature. He always acts in his single hypostasis as the God-man. The hypostatic union of his two natures is fundamentally important for the orthodox understanding of salvation. In this sense, the concept of complementarity does not appear to be directly applicable to orthodox theology. However, there seems to be a potential for the application of the concept of hypostasis hypostasis and quantum mechanics. Wow. It'd be interesting to read about that, huh? Uh, next section here is the uh, an opportunity to apply the concept of hypostasis in quantum mechanics. This section will focus on pointing out the potential value of the theological understanding of the term hypostasis in quantum mechanics. In Niels Bohr's words, in Niels Bohr, Bohr's words, quote, and this is a part where I have not read yet, so this is new to me as well. Quote, information regarding the behavior of an atomic object obtained under definite experimental conditions may be adequately characterized as complementarity to any information about the same object obtained by some other experimental arrangements, excluding the fulfillment of the first conditions. Although such kinds of information cannot be combined into a single picture by means of ordinary concepts, they represent indeed equally essential aspects of any knowledge of the object in question, which can be obtained in this domain. Pretty straightforward, right? What exactly is Bohr trying to convey by using the expressions, quote, about the same object and the object in question? What Bohr appears to be doing is to make a distinction between the unique identity or hypostasis of a specific quantum object and the specific complementarity way of its energetic manifestations. This distinction is crucial for Bohr in insisting on the reality of the quantum world while at the same time accepting that it does not make sense to speak about its, quote, being in a certain way, independent of any interaction with our experimental arrangements. Such view goes beyond the classical understanding of realism by pointing to the role of the observer for the adoption of a much more subtle way of looking at reality, allowing for a self-subsisting object to, ma to manifest mutually exclusive, i.e. complementary, types of natural properties depending on the specific circumstances of the interaction between the observer and the object. It would be highly valuable to find an example from theology referring to a similar linguistic situation. It seems that such an example can be found in the developments, developments after the Third Ecumenical Council in Ephesus 431. Nestorius denied the fact that he who was born of the Virgin is co-substantial with God the Father according to divinity and thus by nature God. 
Nestorius denied the two births of the Logos and the double consubstantiality of the one and the same Logos, Son of God and the self-same also Son of Mary. In this way, he jeopardized the orthodox meaning of salvation. The Third Ecumenical Council ended with a theological misunderstanding between the Alexandrian and Antiochian participants who were chiefly represented by St. Cyril of Alexandria and John of Antioch, respectively. The controversy was formally ended in 433 by the reconciliation between St. Cyril and John of Antioch, where the latter confessed the double consubstantiality of, quote, our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, close quote, i.e. the very doctrine that was violently rejected by Nestorius. In his confession, John of Antioch declares that the only begotten Son of God was, quote, before the ages begotten from the Father according to his divinity, and in the last days the self-same, Donafton, for us and for our salvation, begotten of Mary according to his humanity, the self-same, Donafton, consubstantial with the Father according to divinity, and consubstantial with us according to humanity, close quote. The double use of the expression self-same here emphasizes the reference to the single hypostasis of the only begotten Son of God and not to the union of the two natures used by Nestorius to deny the two births of the Logos and the double consubstantiality of the one and the same Logos. For St. Cyril, John's confession was fully acceptable since this was exactly what Nestorius denied in spite of the fact that John also spoke of, quote, a union of two natures whereby we confess one Christ, one Lord, one God, close quote. So the objection that speaking of two different natures after the union means prediction of the two separate kinds of names, divine and human, i.e. the two separate natures, St. Cyril replies that the division of names does not mean necessarily division of natures, hypostasis, or persons, since all names are predicated of the one logos. What's up, buddy? Sorry about that. All right, so uh, next section, an apophatic realism versus anti-realism. It was already pointed out that Niels Bohr was accused of being an anti-realist. First, he was emphasizing that the limits of our knowledge become part of knowledge itself. Second, he was restricting discourse to aspects of reality while barring questions about reality itself and especially about its objective existence, i.e. about its possession of properties or attributes independent of the specific circumstances. Here again, one can easy, easily find the need for a proper fruitful application of the term hypostasis in quantum mechanics since it allows considering a hypostatically single quantum object in its multiple natural manifestations. Using a hypostatic terminology could underline the fact that reality of the quantum object is unquestionable. However, the knowledge about it goes together with its own natural limitations and there are no words that are able to exhaust it. Very interesting. In addition, the degree and the way of the manifestation of the quantum reality is contingent on the specific circumstances providing the conditions for its proper actualization. In a way similar to the situation in quantum physics where Bohr's defense of the dynamic, non-local nature of quantum objects was used to accuse him of anti-realism. St. Gregory Palamas was found to be excessive in his mystical realism. Quote, The stress Palamas places on the light as not being created and as eternal having no end and no beginning, is developed with specific reference to the defense of the divine light that appears to the hesychast in prayer. If this light, which was supposed to be equal to the light that was present at the transfiguration of Christ, and hence often referred to as the taber light, was a real manifestation of God, then one must ask, should it not be coexistent with God, who is eternal? The discussion about the energies of God in his essence thus emerges quite naturally from the previous statement about the divine light. It is these statements of Palamas stressing the light that presents itself to the hesychasts is God, which bring the question about the ontological properties of the light to its head. Close quote. In both cases, the question about realism bring in the discussion of the nature of symbols. Come in full circle here. 
Both St. Gregory Palamas and Niels Bohr point out the genuine link between symbols and reality, although St. Gregory appears to be much more comprehensive in his elaboration than Bohr is. They both defend the reality of symbols and not a symbolic realism. The similarity of the two approaches opens up the possibility for quantum mechanics to adopt a form of apophatic realism in a way similar to orthodox theology. Here are some of the theological insights that could be found in a recent study by Harlamambos Ventis are quite relevant. Quote, Palamite, Palamite apophatism, apophatism signifies a realist theory of knowledge marked by a strongly pronounced epistemological reserve toward truth. The reserve is best exemplified in apophaticism's categorical downplay of linguistic essentialism and all ontolog ontologisms of language pre premised on the assumption of an asymmetrical relation between reality and language and the prioritization of the former over the latter. Close quote. Such an apophatic approach emphasizes the fact that the reality of things lies independently of our linguistic or conceptual conventions. The theological roots of orthodox apophatic realism emerge out of an epistemological effort to arrive at an authentic vision of the being of God with an exclusive reference to the Trinitarian mode of existence and not to the divine essence. These roots suggest the potential contemporary relevance of apophatic realism, including its potential relevance for quantum mechanics. It, quote, consists in the personalism and the nosteology, nosiology novelty that the latter introduces by considering all existence in relational terms. Apophatism fosters a participatory understanding of truth and knowledge, which teaches us to approach the most ordinary objects in personal terms as entities capable of being known, but still immune to crass objectification. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The ontological integrity of the existence is, quote, safeguarded by means of a cognitive ban of their essence. That is, by rendering meaningless and indeed infeasible all discourse about substances or essences as absolute attributes of existence, close quote. In this view, all entities are considered as lending themselves to being known, quote, in terms of other than those of substance, if by substance is meant an ultimate metaphysical structure or texture to be known under an ideal epistemic conditions, close quote. I think we get to the heart of things here, uh, to the text here. Hey, OGC, I see you in there. Um, Happy New Year, former ghost. I uh, hope you're well as well. Uh, thank you guys for slugging this out with me here we're at the tail end i'd love to know what you think um if this is kind of making sense we got a page and a half left here in terms of the final reflections again uh happy new year um and we're reading from uh, energy and theology and physics uh, uh, again we're looking at the work uh, or the um, language of orthodox theology and quantum mechanics through the lens of saint gregory palamas and niels bohr and now to the final reflection section the initial motivation for this chapter was based on a statement by Christos Yanaris concerning the opportunity for the church to appropriate a new language in linking the salvific message of the gospel to linguistic categories that are much more efficient in the articulation of the existential mode of the relationship between God, world, and man, a language emerging from quantum me mechanics and post-Freudian psychology. Well, let's, I could have just read that one sentence there instead of getting through all these, through all of these, uh, this whole chapter here. The analysis provided here suggests that Christo Yonaris appears to be quite optimistic about it. And it is unquestionable that there is a great value in exploring the similarities in the ways language works in orthodox theology and quantum mechanics. However, as we have already shown, orthodox theology and quantum mechanics are both continuously struggling, each on its own, with the challenges of properly using words and concepts in linking human experience to reality. This struggle appears to be part of their existential modes of operation probably more so in theology than in quantum mechanics. Quote, the transmission of the dogmas cannot be done without their interpretation, i.e. through ex explicating old concepts and terms by contemporary concepts, close quote. And quote, the, advantages, the advantage of this resynchronization is existential, not ethical. Orthodoxy must begin to answer cultural questions, not with ethics, which has proved unsuccessful, but with dogmas. Oof. What's this quote from? 
However, in order to achieve this, it must interpret its dogmas existentially. Man, I'm going to have to read that again. Talk about the flip, right? So the transmission of the dogmas cannot be done without their interpretation. So the dogmas, we need the interpretation, i.e. through explicating old concepts in terms of in terms by contemporary concepts. And the advantage of this resynchronization is existential, not ethical. Orthodoxy must begin to answer cultural questions, not with ethics, which is proved unsuccessful, but with dogmas. However, in order to achieve this, it must interpret its dogmas existentially. Close quote. Love to know what you in the in the chat um, think about that, or if that makes sense in any meaningful way to you, at least initially. I'll have to think about that a bit. The nature of this existential interpretation is not a philosophical one since, quote, every word in the mouth of the church is not only a declaration of the truth, but also an invitation to a free, wholehearted, personal meeting with the truth, since the truth is not something, but someone, Christ himself incarnate, close quote. It would be therefore unlikely to expect the church to just start bringing and adopting quantum mechanical concepts into theology. It would, however, be highly valuable to keep exploring the similarity of the challenges in dealing with the articulation and communication of the human experience of the divine and quantum realities. I believe that such an approach to such an approach to the pursuit of a dialogue between science and theology would be most valuable. I'd love to know what, what you think. The emphasis on the challenges would definitely attract scholarly interest. It would be, however, much more valuable in terms of its potential homiletic and apologetic capacity as a source of human inspiration for the honest pursuit of the divine. One of its key messages could be the promotion of a cognitive attitude based on the realization that in order for man to know God, man must change himself. Or at least realize that the knowledge of God is contingent on the degree and the authenticity of the personal spiritual struggle and participation in the sacramental life of the church. One could therefore say that the synergy between science and theology should be ultimately pursued on a personal existential level. It is only personally as persons that we could adopt the proper apophatic cognitive attitude that could link any scientific and theological insights. Quote, Indeed, man is a theologian in his relation to God and scientist in his relation to the universe. Whilst the universe is the laboratory of God in which man has been placed as custodian. This combination of the theologian with the scientist, i.e. theology and science, is crucial and very significant because it allows man to bypass falsehood and recover the truth. In other words, he is called to demythologize the world from fanciful theories which do not correspond to reality and to perceive the transparency of the universe which points in turn to the transcendental basis of its existence and the ceaseless and inexhaustible energy of the creator world, close quote. Every man conceptualizes the relationship between theology and science through his or her own personal struggles to grasp the natural manifestation and meaning of both divine and created realities. And this struggle cannot happen outside of the church because the church reveals the truest vocation of the world. And this final quote here to end this reading, quote, far from addressing a minority in society, the father spoke boldly and to the whole world. Erudite, cosmopolitan, and conversant with contemporary philosophy and culture, the fathers proclaimed a message of universal import. For them, the world was in the church, not the church in the world. By this, of course, they meant that the world was created for the church and that the church revealed the truest vocation of the world. Close quote. So that, uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, it's the end of that chapter. If you didn't catch part one, uh, check out part one. It's published on, uh, on my, on my channel. Um, that's the end of that chapter there. Thanks guys for, um, slugging through this with me. I hope everybody's has a great, wonderful new year. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on some more live streams, which I'm hoping to do more of this year. Um, and I hope everybody's well. So thank you. Happy new year and God bless till next time.